Chapter 3.9, Part 1. So we're getting into the late modern, early contemporary art um, trends. We were already in modernism um, to a degree. Cezanne definitely is considered modernist. And the Impressionists are too, but not um, in the way that we think of it typically. And we're going to get into that uh, for the 20th century. We think of it mainly as a 20th century phenomenon, but it really does start in 1860. You know, realism, we have photography, we have Impressionism and Expressionism that happens in the early uh, 1900s. So a lot is changing, and um, there's a lot of global expansion in commerce, politics, cultural traditions, communications, travel. That is kind of what what uh, the basis for World War One is. World War One started really with an assassination um, that seemingly didn't have um, a lot of critical meaning, you know, <clears throat> very small country, but it did expand and it is an expression of all these other um, changes in borders and things like that. There was a lot of arguing things were starting to become solidified in terms of who owned what and colonization was going on of course and money coming in from the colonies is still happening and that starts to break apart you know like south america mexico um even parts of africa and asia are saying no we don't want to be a colony anymore and there's several struggles there's a lot of struggle and activity happening also, um, you know, we have just travel going back and forth. So cultural tr traditions are being broken down by the Industrial Revolution. Don't ever forget about that. That affected um, us probably more than any other change in human history because that was where we went from farming. Well, some say it's the Neolithic where you went from hunter-gatherer to farmer but some historians will say it's when we went from farmer to uh, living in a city and working in a factory. So those are two big shifts. The other big shift is computers, um, and we're still looking at that <clears throat> in terms of the effects on human living, but um, I digress. So the revolution of color and form happens. Matisse and Pablo Picasso, they are contemporaries. Matisse is a little bit older, uh, I think about 12 years older than Picasso, Similar span of time and a similar way that they get into various um, uh, isms and various explorations of what they do. Their work changes um, in in big chunks and different. They have different ways of working and um, very prolific. So those two things they have in common: prolific and that their work changes a lot. And then I guess you could say the third thing is their lifespans are very similar. Friendly rivalry, French, Spanish, although Picasso is mostly in France for most of his life, partly to do with Francisco Franco, who takes over uh, prior to Guernica, and uh, Picasso refuses to return to Spain while Franco's living. And um, I think they die just around Picasso and uh, Franco, die right around the same time in the 70s. So I don't think he ever does return. So Matisse is color and form, and Picasso is form and shape. Those are their focus. Um, and you're going to see it plays out quite differently um, in, in a visual way. So Matisse is our French artist. He founded Fauvism. This is French for wild beasts. Again, like the Impressionists, a newspaper critic um, coined this term. It's called them the wild beasts for their crazy colors. <clears throat> Influential and unique style, expressive forms, decorative style, bold use of color. Matisse is the only artist in art history that has such a big name by using bright, high-key colors, meaning the yellows and the oranges and the pinks and the green, uh, bright greens and things like that. He doesn't get into um, a dark tonal painting. And you can really see the difference when we start to look at Picasso. So we have this Fauvist piece here, and um, we see all this wild use of color. Now we kind of can go back to Gauguin a little bit in terms of, um, well, two things. 
the putting of color, like the sky is pink, Gogan is disregarding, if you think of your yellow palm trees, he disregards the actual color of the object and decides to do what he wants to do. That's partly why they're, the Fovis are called the wild beast. So you're seeing that comparison. Also, the idea that we are in this sort of natural uh, pre, how do you want to say it, um, primal sort of world before you would say uh, the fall of, of man <clears throat> or a primitive world perhaps that exists out of France. You know, it's like these people are all naked. They're enjoying nature. They're, they're making love. They're um, innocent and pure. And that's where the pure color comes in. Like the, he's just using all this color. He's not mixing it down and making t tint and tones and shadows. So they're not really in real space. Uh, and we have some different areas and the proportions and their, um, um, you know, scale of the larger figures are somewhat in the front and smaller in the back, but not really. It's not, it's, he's not really working with that. It gets very flat. And then if you notice how the trees are just kind of merging and there's just random color behind people. So he gets very excited about color, very excited about the human form in this kind of linear way. There's just some bare lines to uh, delineate the form, and he gets really well known for this, especially in his cutouts. Um, so he wasn't interested in nature, and he's wanting the colors to vibrate, to be make them very vibrant and intense. But again, he uses bright color, very unusual. So it's emotional and sweet and happy because we associate those with um, joy and, and uplift and... <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, no darkness or sadness. So that he's the only one who works in this way. <clears throat> excuse me, Red Studio, when I was in art school, for some reason, Matisse was like the be-all, end-all. And there was a big show at uh, MoMA, a retrospective in New York, um, and I went out and I flew out and saw that. But he, he just resonated with art students, I would say, in the 90s. People were really excited about him again. And this happens. I know I'm digressing a little bit here, but what happens, like, we understand Van Gogh on and off really, really well, um, but he's kind of more of a constant. But other artists, they sort of come into um, popularity again, and Matisse really had another, I would say, peak time where people appreciated his work in the 90s, although he only lived to the 60s, um, you know. But, but there are times where certain works become um, uh, important again or, they un or it makes sense in the world because of what's going on. I couldn't tell you exactly why that was, but uh, he just was the bee's knees. He was just the biggest thing uh, going in about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Okay, so he's eliminated a lot of detail. And we know this because there are sketches of these um, scenes and this is his studio but we have sketches and paint and probably uh, photographs as well um, of his studio and he goes through and he thinks about this very carefully about what he can remove so when we look at this grandfather clock for instance um, there's no detail on it there's no door because you have to open it and wind it there's just the clock face and the outline but not exactly the outline. You can see it has some three-dimensional space. It's coming forward just a little bit. Um, but he's really just indicating shapes here with these lines. He's just telling us the chair is there, but the chair is the same color as the floor and the wall, and it's just barely there. He's giving you some information um, about what's there. This might be his um, chalk stick, or it might be a cigarette box, I'm not sure. But we have a plate here with a sort of a Matisse-like figure on it, a plant that's growing, uh, outlines of a glass, but he's playing around with how much information he wants to give you. So it accurately shows an, some actual artworks in his studio, but he's just putting all that red in there uh, to give you some intensity of colors. There, Everything's collapsed sort of into a single flat plane, and he is using color to convey his experience. Might be an intense feeling when he goes in the studio. Some people have that, that it's sort of like, um, you know, supercharged. Oh, we do get the cutouts. 
Now, I often assign this projects. I absolutely love these things. I just think it's one of the coolest things that's ever happened in art ever. And what happened was Matisse started to lose his sight. And also, as you can see, I don't know exactly his illness. It looks something like diabetes. He's got swelling and he, he can't get up and around. He can't paint a canvas. Um, much longer in 53 he lives into the 60s um, <clears throat> so he's decided to take colored paper and cut it out now he can't see it all that well um, oh he lives till 54 I beg your pardon so this is a year before his death but he's cutting out these beautiful organic shapes he sees seaweed um, on on the beach he's he's in the south of France now. He's moved out of Paris. He's in the south of France and he's um, by the sea and he's ill. And so he's cutting out all these different shapes and then he's got an assistant that picks him up and tacks him to the wall. And look at this fun figure. It's almost like Josephine Baker dancing with this um, little skirt and some strings and you know just look at the shapes. I just think they're stunning. He uses a lot of complementary colors where they they really pop where he puts like a red background with a blue figure on it just tremendous sense of shape and form and color and he does this with colored paper much like construction paper you'd get for little kids so if you look at this back um on this uh studio shelf here and this is probably just a board on some um horses that's what you call it it's a horse it's for construction he just throws things together. There's a crate there. He's like, voila, I have a studio. <laughs> so he just wants to work and make the work. So he's got his scissors. He's cutting out paper. And he's making an unholy mess. And somebody picks this up and pins it on the wall. And it's just gorgeous. Okay, so there's some beautiful colors he's got to work with. Back in the day, that's how big those construction paper uh, pieces used to come from anyway that you'd get for schools. Now they come in smaller, regular size packets. So he, uh, he helped to plan compositions, but when he, um, it, this was originally just sort of like a, a way to work, but he invented this, and I meant to say that. He invented this way of working, and he used these cutouts to quickly cut, you know, to, to cut them out, and then he'd paste them up to sort of get some idea about how to place things in his actual paintings. But then once he couldn't get up, he used them as, he presented them as completed works. And I'll try to include a video for that, but they're so beautiful and they're so fun. Okay, so Picasso, Brock, and Cubism, that we shift gears quite a bit in terms of the visual, but the same level of focus and concern with um, concepts of art and what's happening at the time. So a little, this is a little more to the point of intellectualism. Matisse is a little more playful, put it that way. Still dealing with some ideas, still very thoughtful in his intent. Um, but Picasso and Brock, they're pals. They're in um, Paris together working, and they develop Cubism. They also develop uh, collage. That that happens, the two of them together. And then not long after that, they sort of part ways. But they were kind of hanging out together, and they came up with this Cubism. And um, they're thinking about geometric form. Now, this is all coming from Einstein's theories of relativity, of uh, time and space, and compressing um, um, movement, that kind of thing. And also um, some different things that are going on around them that they're getting exposed to, one of which is African masks, and we'll, we'll look at this. Um, so we're going to depict objects and figures from more than one side.